Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to our Wednesday night COP online service. It is so wonderful to be with you. Have you been waiting for this moment? I have. I've been waiting for this time where we can be together, studying God's Word, worshiping together, expecting great things from the Lord. As always, we start with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge." His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Lord, you are so, so good. Amen. Well, for our praise moment today, tonight, I want us to say, it's Burr, so advance Merry Christmas, everybody, and because it's Burr, we're going to talk about Emmanuel. Well, Emmanuel is a perfect, perfect thing for us to talk about, because what does it mean? It means God with us. Now, Emmanuel, you have a lot of names in Israel that end with the L because L is God, El Shaddai, and so on, the other names of God, El. And so we have Israel, which includes the name of God in, in that name. We also have Daniel, we have Ezekiel, we have um Many, when you go to Israel, you start recognizing all these words and names that have L, 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 airlines, L. It's incorporated in a lot of things. So Emmanuel, Emmanu means with us, and then L means God. So with us, God, (laughs) the with us God. That's what Emmanuel means, right? And we are reminded from Psalm 91, verse 15, where God says, you know this, I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. That's Psalm 91, 15. We read it every day, and we are so familiar with that. I will be with him. God with us. Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name... Emmanuel, by the very name of God, he wants us to know that he is with us. See, we humans, we didn't name him Emmanuel. God instructed that Jesus' name would be Emmanuel, God with us. God wants us to know that he is with us us. He wants us to know that we are not alone. And in Psalm 91, verse 15, it says, I will be with him in 
trouble. Well, in James chapter 5, verses 13 to 15, you know this passage. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. Are any of you suffering hardships? That's New Living Translation. But the other translation says, is any of you in trouble? Are you in trouble? Well, have you ever been in trouble? And I'm not talking about um, you broke something, you broke your dad's computer, or you did something wrong. I'm not talking about that kind of trouble. I'm talking about being in trouble because you stood up for what was right, because you wanted to serve the Lord, because you wanted to do good things, <laughs> you know, to the point that they say, uh, what is it the saying that some people say, no good deed goes unpunished? <laughs> Sometimes you get in trouble for trying to do the right thing. Well, Daniel, he got in trouble. He was praying three times a day, no matter what. And even when the edict from the king says, you will not pray to anybody except me, he continued because he knew what he must do for his God. And so he prayed three times a day. And yes, he did get thrown into the lion's den. <laughs> Would you call that trouble? Yeah, I guess so. But God was Emmanuel. God was with him. The, the with him God, the with us God. Emmanuel, with us God. And God rescued him and honored him. That is literally true in the life of Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into the fiery furnace. Would you call that trouble? Yes, indeed. But who was that fourth man that they saw walking in the fiery furnace with them? They were not even tainted by that fiery furnace. Jesus was with them in trouble. Like Joseph who was thrown in prison in Egypt, but later put in charge and later elevated to Pharaoh's palace. He was in a bad place. He was in trouble, but God was with him in trouble, and he rescued him and honored him. Like the disciples, rowing in the storm, and it's rocking the boat and the water coming in. Jesus was with them, and he rescued them. Peace, be still. Oh, you might be in trouble today. You might have found yourself in some kind of trouble, but no matter what the trouble is, Jesus is with you. Peace, be still. Emmanuel, with you in trouble. And did you know that you will not stay in trouble. In trouble is not your new normal. <laughs> oh, well, this is where I'm living now. I'm just in trouble. That's not your new normal. You are getting out of the fire unscathed. You are getting out of the lion's den without a scratch unharmed. And you are getting peace instead of the storm in Jesus' name. He will be with you in trouble and rescue you and honor you. His name is Emmanuel, God with us, the with us God. <laughs> Remember that, God with us. Amen. Let us worship the Lord together with no boundaries. And Pastor Jerwill, Pastor Jerwill wrote this song, and it's beautiful. It says, Emmanuel. Like a star in the sky On a cloudy windy night Though 
the sky seems to change the star in me. Oh, your promises, oh God, they will never fade. Though everything else change, your word remains. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust. Hello tatay, hello nanay. Are you 60 years old or above or maybe you're almost 60 years old? Then this one is especially for you. What can you expect when you join us? First, you'll have a great time as we open with heartfelt worship. Then you'll be encouraged as we have a wonderful time with words of wisdom or wow moments. And we know that wisdom is very important to you because you have lived it. You're proving it and you are now enjoying the fruit of wisdom in your life. Have fun with our very engaging segment called Sababa. When we received Jesus Christ in our life, we also received a new identity. 
an identity that we are forgiven, we are set free, and we are made whole. Isn't he so And rediscover your energy as you participate in a very active segment called Dance Along. And worship the Lord again as we sing all great worship hymns and songs in golden hour. And we'll come together for a time of fervent prayer as we bring up to the Lord your prayer request. It's always a great joy to pray for you. So how do we pray? Fervently and with joy. And of course, it will not be complete without you joining us. Senior Moments to Remember, Monday to Fridays, 9 to 9.30 in the morning through Cathedral of Praises YouTube and Facebook accounts. We will be waiting for you. See you. Moments to Remember Just before Brother John comes, let me give you some good news. We can have services again. Now, we may change this next week depending on implementing guidelines that are given to us. And there's even talk about maybe 30% capacity. But at this point, what we're looking at for this weekend only, all right, Friday night, curfews are lifted. We can have until 10 o'clock to get home. So Friday night service, we will start our normal service at 7 o'clock. And I'm only going to run about an hour and a half service. I think we've learned how to sing with the mask and things on now. So we're going to have a good, good time of worship and get ourselves back in worship and prayer rather than just, just focusing on a short time of worship and short time of sermon and short everything. We're going to at least try to do an hour and a half service on Friday night. That will be in all, all four campuses carried together. Saturday morning, I'm still going to do two drive-in services in both locations, South and Maine. 7.30 and 9.30. Now this is for those of you, the seniors come out to this because they don't get out of their cars. The young people come to this because they don't get out of their cars. Uh, those with medical conditions, those that don't feel comfortable being around crowds, they come to the drive-in services. And I don't mind the hard work. I'm just so happy to be able to be your pastor and be a blessing to you. So Saturday morning, 7.30 and 9.30. Saturday night, we'll have another live service. We'll carry it in all four campuses. I'll be preaching down at Maine. Sunday morning, the campus pastors will be preaching at 7.30. I'll preach at 10 o'clock. The campus pastors will preach at 12.30. I'll preach at 3 o'clock. So we're going to have a lot of services this weekend. Friday night, two Saturday morning, Saturday night, and then four on Sundays. Now, in addition to that, we're going to keep the, the um, Fortress 91 going all next week. Uh, the water baptisms will continue all next week if you'd like to get water baptized, but you have to call ahead for that. Okay, we can be prepared because we have some special sanitation things we have to do and cleansing things. And we can't we have to empty the water and refill it again before a person and sanitize it. And we got a lot of things to work on with that. But it's a pleasure to be a blessing to you. And let's pray for 30 um, percent. That'll mean a little less work, but that's all right. And brothers and sisters, you need to be in church. I mean, please, I, I understand, I understand, I understand. But you need to be in the house of God. I'll see you this weekend. Well, praise the Lord, child of God. It's good to be back with you again and just have this opportunity to share a few words with you. You know, the Bible tells us that Christ in us is the hope of glory. And Vine's Bible Dictionary says that glory, that word is doxa in the, uh, in the Greek, and it means all that God is and all that God has. Now, Christ in you. Isn't that amazing that that would be all that God is and all that God has, a glory that would be in you. But you see, here's the thing that get us distracted. It's another verse that tells us that we're going from glory unto glory into his marvelous image. So there's a process that's taking place. It doesn't happen from one day to the next. And uh, one of the things that I found is that if I can start moving apart of God's personality into me and start exercising a part of God's personality, it all of a sudden it becomes easier to go to the next step of God's personality and just to go from one glory to the other glory. Now, in the it'll have to be when we see him face to face that we'll finally be into the fullness of what he has planned for us. But I'm, and I'm interested in getting going now, getting started. And if something took place over in Exodus, the 35th chapter, that is a, it, it is the first glimmer of that Christ being in them, that the God that they were worshiping 
that he was in them because in this portion, we find the 35th chapter that it tells us there in that fourth and fifth verse that God declares that there's gonna be an offering taken. And then he's very unique the way he says it. He doesn't say everybody's gonna give. He says it's gonna be a time when those that have a willing heart, a willing heart. Now, when you come to a willing heart, can you imagine being the son of God, the Lord Jesus, and having who you are and all that and, 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 and the glory and splendor of heaven and then God says, we, we, we have to save man and some one of us is gonna to have to die on that cross and we're gonna to have to bear the sin. And there had to be a willingness in Jesus that would be beyond our ability to understand to take and trade all the glory for the shame that took place that day at the cross. And, uh, but this offering ends up in the 36th chapter being so big that they had to stop the people from giving. One of the things that I noticed that was very powerful about this offering, it didn't say, now everybody give a little, everybody do this or everybody do that, uh, this amount or that amount. It simply said, if you're of a willing heart, you're a part of this. But see, the old nature is not willing. So if you're just an unwilling heart to get involved in an offering with God, then you've got to be able to discern spirits. And that spirit that's manifesting is that old nature coming up and saying, look, we don't need to do that. Let's don't do that. All they want is our money. But the, the, the apostle here, the prophet here tells, uh, uh, Moses says, don't ask anybody to give that's not willing. And you'd say, whoa, whoa, that's kind of dangerous, isn't it? Just a willing ones? Well, see, the divine nature, the divine nature will be more than enough. I just came from a meeting, COVID separated, where there's usually 500 to 700 people and there must have been 80 people in the room. And with that 80 people, we were raising money for student pastors to have an education. And there was only two people that didn't give. And all of the deficit from the year before and all of the money for the future to come came out of that little handful of people. And the thing was, they were willing to drive, go across the country. They were willing to put up with all of the social mask. They were willing, all these things that had cost just to be in that meeting. And when they were there, I told them, and I started, I said, this will be a great offering. Because when, when there's not so many people, there is easier to have agreement. And where's agreement, God gets right in it. Well, only two people didn't take envelopes. They may have given some other way. I don't, I'm not judging them. But I'm just saying that when you go through this, you'll find a willing heart whose heart stirred them up. And what is that? That is taking right now, if you'll just let God guide you in an offering today and not get the old nature in it and just what's really coming from inside of you. And all of a sudden, the divine nature will take over and God will be able to reach in and just have you give the exact amount that will take and just bring forth that harvest that you need for whatever's going on. Because I'm hearing about houses getting paid off during this COVID time. I'm hearing about miracle car payments being paid off. I'm hearing about all kind of explosive financial miracles taking place. And by the way, I take one more second here, not a lot of time, but at this very moment, there's more gospel being preached all over the world than has ever been preached before because the social media is exploding with it. Every language, every tongue, every people with stammering lips, people that don't hardly even know how to preach, just getting on, giving their testimony about Jesus Christ. And I think that there is a move in the spirit world. And when there is, it's not away from God, but it's towards God. And now as we take an offering, what a wonderful thing. It's like in that 36th chapter, when they came and, and told uh, uh, the Moses said, hey, fellas, there's more than enough. There's more than enough. Well, well did everybody give? No, there's a bunch of people that didn't do everything, but there was the willing hearted ones. And I speak to you now. I ask you, and those of you that are, listening in on their social media, there's going to be a tremendous explosion of 30-fold, 60-fold, of 100-fold return. And it's coming. But I, it's for, you know, it's strange. I'm talking here and you'd think you're reaching to everybody, but I'm not. I'm not talking to everybody. I'm talking to you. Those that will have a willing heart. And don't get all puffed up and proud because really what that is, it's the divine nature beginning to manifest in you. And this offering is a time that'll draw you near to God and that financial
burdens will be broken. Broken. In the name of Jesus, I speak this offering is blessed 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And I thank you, God, that there will be more than enough. Isn't it wonderful? God is a more than enough God. I mean, lilies everywhere, flowers everywhere. How many feet of intestine do we need? We got three times more than anybody needs. Everything, God just lavishes it out there because God's a giver. And let the divine nature lead you in this special moment. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me a moment in your life. As we turn our attention to the book of Romans tonight, I'd like us to pick up in Romans chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. It is not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world. Remember, that's that big promise God made. But through righteousness, it comes by faith. For if those who live by the law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Now, last night... All I did was teach you about the object of our faith, that God is the object of our faith, not our faith, not a religious system, not religious ceremony, not our own abilities. We don't believe in ourselves. We believe in God. We don't believe in science. <laughs> we believe in God. And that means sometimes you just have to decide, I'm not going to try to figure it all out. I'm just going to believe God. So we learned that Abraham believed that God could do what he said he could do, that Abraham believed that God had the power to raise the dead. And Abraham believed that God had the power to call things that are not as though they were. Now, and lastly, that he believed what God said about him. But now I want to pick up and begin to talk about the actions of faith. Now, let's start with verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. This is the paradox of hope against hope. You see, sometimes faith is going to go contrary to natural hope. Now, it doesn't go contrary to spiritual hope, but sometimes faith is going to go contrary to natural hope. In the natural, Abraham had no hope. He had no confident expectation of a future good. In the natural, there was no way he would ever have children. In the natural, there was no way he would ever become the father of many nations. In the natural, there was no future for him. In the natural, when he died, he would go to heaven, but it would all be over. But see, faith does not rest upon a super, on a natural hope. Faith rests upon a supernatural hope. Let me read you verse 18 from the Robertson translation. Past hope, in hope, he trusted. Past hope, in hope, he trusted. Now, you're going to have to understand that there is a natural hope, a natural confident expectation of future good, a natural optimism. But um, sometimes there's no more of that. And you have to understand, without hope, faith has no foundation. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for. If there's no hope, there is no faith. Faith can only flow from a foundation of hope. 
Faith does not flow from a, a, an attitude of negativity. Faith flows from an attitude of optimism. Faith flows from a, a positive mental attitude. Faith flows from a confident expectation of future good. All hope is, is you don't know how it's going to be all right, but it's going to be all right. I mean, it's just, that, that, that's the foundation. This is where, where hope begins. But beloved, there are times when all natural hope is gone. When there is no way in the natural. No way. You look at everything and in the natural, you know, forgive me, all your positive expectations, all of your positivity, all of your, your positive thinking. <laughs> there are times when it all just flat runs out. Some of this stuff today is, is, is new age guru theology and it's nonsense. But there comes a point when all that natural hope runs out. And in times like this, <laughs> in hope against hope, you have to believe. You say, well, how do you get this hope that stands against natural hope? Romans 15, verse 13. Paul says, may the God of hope, may the God of a confident expectation of future good, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. As you, as you trust in him, he'll fill your heart with all joy. He'll fill your heart with peace so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, to, to maybe oversimplify it, it's like, all right, God just looks at your soul one day and says, they've run out of natural hope. <laughs> so God says, I'm going to fill them up with joy. And you don't even understand why you're happy. It, it, is not, it is not a natural joy. He fills you with all joy. And then he fills you with peace. And you, you take those two things together in the human soul, and it's, it's quite an encounter with God. When you're just bursting with joy and you're bursting with peace. Remember, peace means the absence of conflict. And then he touches you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And all of that peace and joy overflow in hope. Ah. Now, this is what God does. Now, maybe this will explain to you some of the experiences that you've had in God where you came in brokenness and really, really ready to give up. You know, your eyes, the light had gone out of your eyes. You were so discouraged, you couldn't even lift your head anymore. And you were, you were ready to give up. And, and you came and you kneeled and you humbled yourself before God. And God just did something on your insides that you don't know how to explain. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you were full of joy. All of a sudden, the conflict was all gone. You were full of peace. And then there was like this touch of the Holy Ghost that came upon your life, and you began to see the whole world differently. Your whole, you had an attitude adjustment of the Holy Ghost kind. And all of a sudden, you just saw the world differently. And when you came out of that encounter with God, when you came out of that place of prayer, the whole world just looks different. <laughs> you don't know how it's going to be all right, but you know it's going to be all right. And people look at you and go, man, what happened to you? You were, you were ready to quit. Now you're digging in again. Yeah, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Ah. And now all of a sudden you're working again. Now all of a sudden you've got new hope. Your natural hope, it always runs out but the God of hope fills you with all joy, fills you with peace, touches you by the power of the Holy Ghost, and now you're overflowing with hope. And that supernatural hope becomes the foundation of now faith is being sure of what we hoped for. Now, let's begin to unwrap this problem with Abraham a little bit more. Verse 19. Without weakening in his faith, I like the NIV translation on this, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact 
that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. Now, do you remember yesterday I taught you that when Romans 4.17 says, God calls the things that are not as though they were, and that that is a creative voice, that is not a destructive voice, and that is not a voice of lying. It's a creative voice. He calls the things that are not as though they were. He does not call the things that are that, that are as though they are not. Now, listen carefully. He does not call the things that are as though they are not. He calls the things that are not as though they were, past tense. Now, that's an important thing because many Christians, when they start getting into the, the, the principles of faith and confession, forgive me, everybody just thinks they're lying. Now, Abraham didn't lie. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. He didn't stand up and say, I'm a virile hundred-year-old man. I have sex with my wife three times a day. He didn't stand up and just start talking as if things were true that were not true. He didn't call the things that were as though they were not. That's not what he did. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Now, now, now look at that passage there with me, please. He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Now, he didn't hide from this fact. Hundred years old, he is probably rather impotent. Now, I'm trying to say this delicately. Sarah, she has bypassed menopause so long ago, she does not even remember what a hot flash is. There is no longer any life in her ovaries producing eggs. Abraham is not producing sperm. These are sweet, wonderful old people and their reproductive organs are gone. Okay, I mean, they have, they have dried up and gone. Now, Abraham didn't try to pretend like that's not true. Abraham faced the facts. Now, the Greek word here that's translated face literally means fix your eyes or fix your mind upon. upon. He fixed his eyes and he fixed his mind right upon the facts. You know what? God, I'm 100 years old. My wife and I haven't done that in a long time. God, I'm impotent. I don't produce sperm. Sarah, she's all dried up. There's no eggs coming out anymore. God, I will face those facts. He said, those are devastating facts. But he said, I'm not going to try to lie and pretend like these things aren't true. He said, I'm, I'm going to face these facts. Now, now, brothers and sisters, you will never, you will never see great miracles in your life while you're trying to pretend and live in a, a world of unreality. Don't pretend like these facts aren't there, like the proverbial ostrich sticking his head in the sand. You face the fact, and then you choose to put your faith in an even greater fact. Jesus said it this way in John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Now, the Greek word here for truth, aletheia, means reality. There is a deeper reality than the reality that you're looking at. Now, let me illustrate it to you from a, a kid's show. Do you remember The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? One of my favorite books. I, I used to love to read it to, to Pastor A when she was a little girl, and I'd go to school and read it to her class. And sometimes I'd just like to read it for myself. But one of my favorite passages is after Aslan dies on the stone table, he tells the story later that there's a deeper truth that's been hidden. Brothers and sisters, the doctors may look at you and say, you have 30 days to live. Your cancer is in stage end. Okay, I accept the fact of what the doctor says. That's real, that's true. Those things are in my body. But there's a higher truth. There's a deeper truth. That is, the cancer in my body is a reality. But there's an even greater reality. The word of God. His word says, by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. Peter, 
Jesus is the healer. Jesus carried away in his body by the stripes that came across his back. He carried away my sicknesses, my pains, and my diseases. <laughs> There's a higher truth. Right now, some of you are so struggling with finances. And you look at your bank account and you go, do I even have enough to keep a bank account open? But there's a higher truth. You face that fact. But there's a higher truth. For those who sow seed, Paul said, my God shall meet all of your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. Jesus said, give and it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Jesus hung on a tree to bear the curse of the law for us, that the blessings of Abraham might come to us. And part of that curse of the law that we were redeemed from is the curse of financial failure and poverty. There are higher truths. Jesus said, the word of God is truth. The word of God is reality. The word of God is a greater reality than anything that you're experiencing in this natural world. God's reality overrules natural reality. Now, my logical scientific mind doesn't get that sometimes. My logical scientific mind didn't get it when I had tuberculosis in both lungs and I went in for my checkup about three months later and the doctor looked at me and said, well, you're my good news. There's no tuberculosis in your lungs. And I don't even have any scar tissues in my lungs. My logical, natural mind doesn't get that. But God knew I had a work to do. Now, you just need to understand. You're looking at a guy who's seen too many miracles. Okay, I mean, why? Well, I want to see more miracles, but please don't misunderstand me. I've seen too many miracles to believe that natural reality is stronger than the reality of the word. God's reality overrules natural reality. Your salvation is proof of that. In the natural, there was no hope for your life. But God said, you could become a new creature in Christ. All the old things passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. This is the beauty of the reality of the word of God. Now, if I can put an application in here, this is why you have to be careful when it comes to some people's teaching on the confession of faith. Now, I believe in, in faith and confession of faith out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. I believe that you fill your heart with the word of God. I don't believe you sit around and act like a parrot. Mock, by his stripes I have been healed. Mock, by his stripes I have been healed. You know, that's just head knowledge. Something's got to so fill your heart that out of the abundance of your heart, you confess your faith. And confession, homo legea, means to say the same thing as. You don't make up your own little, you know, I see people walking around reading books of confessions. These are my confessions of faith written by this famous evangelist. I said, put that away. If you're going to let something fill your heart, fill your heart with the word of God. And then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Now take it a step farther. So faith, we talked about Faith flows from hope. Faith against all hope in hope. Faith against all natural hope in spiritual hope believes. Supernatural hope. Faith faces the facts without weakening. And thirdly, faith refuses to stagger at the promises of God. Now look at verse 20. Yet he did not waver or stagger through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Now the word waver or stagger here means to judge between two or to vacillate between two opinions. It is, it is the concept of a mental struggle. Faith makes up its mind. You, you can't be in two minds. You can't be a double-minded man, okay? You can't be in two minds about this. Abraham was not in two minds. He didn't keep... You know, okay, I'm not sure I believe. I'm not sure I believe. Well, I might believe. Well, I'm not sure I believe. Well, I believe. Well, I'm not sure. You, you, you can't live like that. Faith has to make up your mind. Abraham did not fight a mental struggle. Romans 4, verse 20 and 21. Yet he did not stagger or waver 
through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded. He'd made up his mind. He was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. New Living Translation. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was absolutely convinced that God was able to do anything he promised. Now, brothers and sisters, there's a couple of things I want you to see there. Anything he promised had the power to do what he had promised, the New International Version says. Not the power to do anything you ask, the power to do anything he promised. Now, if there is not a clear promise in the Word of God, forgive me, you're on some pretty shaky grounds. And, and this is where I would differ from, from some people who preach some strange things on faith and confession. I, I don't think that we just decide that we're going to do something and then we have no promise to stand on. I, I believe that we stand on the promises of God, that God had the power to do what he had promised, not what I had committed God to, but what God had promised. Now, now, I know it sounds like I'm splitting hairs here, but listen to me carefully. You cannot have faith for God to do what you committed him to do, but you can have faith and you can be strengthened in your faith and you can be fully persuaded in your faith that God can do what he has promised. So when it comes to healing, I have clear promises. When it comes to provision, I have clear promises. And you go through whatever it is that God has been speaking to you, you need to make sure that those destinies and that guidance is based on a promise of God and not just something that you felt because you'd eaten too many balut or too much shaky's pizza the night before, okay? You need to make sure that when God has spoken to you about something, there are clear promises that God has for you. Now, I've always been a little weird about this because I, I really believe that there's life in the Word. I really believe in the power of God's Word. If you will look back in my old Bibles, you can see the verses that God spoke to me when he called me to the ministry. Major changes in my life. You will see the promises, the, the verses that God spoke to me to become your pastor over 40 years ago, coming up on 41 years. You will see the promises that God spoke to me about the building program years ago when everybody thought Pastor Summer was going to be destroyed now. But God has spoken promises to me. And I can be fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he promised, not what I committed him to. Now, now this, this is real faith. Now, this isn't, this isn't phony baloney faith. This isn't, the, this isn't <laughs> presumptive faith. This is real faith. Let me close with this. When I first met Dr. Cho, Bismarck Hotel, 1980. No, 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 1978. 1978, Bismarck Hotel. Dr. Cho preached a sermon called Real Versus Imitated Faith. And one of the reasons I just admired him is I sat there and I listened to a man who was so honest preach. It's one of the reasons I like Pastor Dag. When you listen to him, he's just honest. I mean, he's not trying to impress everybody with his spirituality. He's just honest. But Dr. Cho told the story about real versus imitated faith. And he told about how he almost destroyed himself and his church of trying to get into a television ministry when God had not called them into it. And then he gave the illustration of Pharaoh and Moses, Egypt and Israel. Israel, God spoke a promise to them, and they crossed through on dry ground. Pharaoh in Egypt saw what Israel did and said, we can do that too. Uh, they died that day. They had imitated faith. They were imitating what somebody of faith did. And this is why I keep telling you, God had the power to do what he promised, not what you have committed him to, not what you've seen him do for somebody else. What has he promised for you? Now, let me pray for you, because some of you right now, you're struggling. I mean, you're, you're trying to keep one nostril above water not to drown. Your finances are hurting. 
You run up the credit cards right now trying to survive COVID-19. And your stomach is beginning to hurt every time the phone rings now because you're behind in your bills. God's going to make a way where there is no way. I want you to remember, and ever since this thing began, beloved, how many times have I talked to you to remember? Remember all the seed that you have sown. Just like with Cornelius, that seed has come up as a memorial offering before God. Memorial means something to be remembered, never forgotten. Think of all the seed that you have sown, the, the poor that you have helped and fed, the gospel that has gone out because of your sowing for missions, the, the houses of God that we have built together. Think of all the seed that you have sown. Now, you need to remember God made a promise to you. God made a promise to the sower. Jesus said it this way, Give, and it shall be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Paul said it this way to the church of Philippi. Those who had been giving and sowing, and my God shall meet all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Paul talks about people who sowed seed to help him with the ministry. He said, it has been credited to your heavenly account. You need to remember all that seed that you have sown and understand God has not forgotten. And these are promises. These are promises that you can count on. Now, may I beg of you, be fully persuaded. As NLT says, be absolutely convinced that God has the power to do what he promised. Father, we need some incredible financial miracles to flow for your people. Father, they need to see heaven opened and an abundance flowing. Father, we don't ask you to fill up our bank accounts and goofy things like that. You said you'd provide by blessing the work of our hands. Father, I ask you for more work to do and work that earns well than we have ever seen before. I ask you for opportunities to flow to your people like they have never seen before. I ask you for sales to happen, Father, for property sales that have been held back by the devil. Lord, as they sought you and as they came before you, those demons have held back that answer. Lord, in the name of Jesus, let the great mighty angels of heaven come and remove those hindering spirits. That, Lord, this answer will flow and those property sales will flow in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for those businesses, that new customers and new clients will begin to come. I pray for those careers, Father, for promotions. They worked hard, Father. Now, let promotion come from the Lord and salary increases that all these debts can be wiped away. Father, we are fully persuaded. We are absolutely convinced that you can do what you have promised. Some of my brothers and sisters, Lord, need a God encounter. When you look in their eyes, they, they've run out of natural hope. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh God, you need to initiate this because their hearts are so broken that they don't even know how to lift up their heads to you. Father, in your grace and in your mercy, just like you came to Abraham and initiated. Just initiate a God encounter in their life and lift their head. Fill them with all joy and fill them with peace and touch them by the power of the Holy Ghost and let their hearts overflow and explode with hope. I thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. As a family, you need to begin talking about what service you're going to be in this weekend. It's time to be back in the house of God. It's time to be back in the presence where he walks among us. So we'll see you either in drive-in services or in one of the services. And hey, brothers and sisters, if you say, Pastor, with the curfew lifted, it's hard on the weekends because of a lack of transportation, but I want to come to church on the way home from work. I'll do church on Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, whatever it takes to take care of you. God has given me a responsibility to feed the sheep, to care for the flock of which he's made me an overseer.
and to know the condition of the flock. And that doesn't change in COVID-19. And that doesn't change because I'm 63 years old. I'm a catabell. I can go forever in Jesus' name. So you just tell us. You tell us what we need to do to continue to help you in Jesus' name. We'll see you in the morning. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Somerl of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again tomorrow at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Somerl every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. We have a Saturday online special service at 7 p.m. at this social media page. Our drive-in service is available for booking and happens every Saturday and Sunday at 7.30 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. at our COP Main and South Campus parking lots. Fortress 91 is from Tuesday to Sunday from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. in all Cathedral Praise campuses. For more information, booking reservations, and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.